Listen. Now after getting Saw 3D the final chapter, which was not the third or the final chapter, it's cool that this is going to be a franchise that my grandchildren are going to be watching, because it's never going to die. And now we have a spinoff called Spiral, which is meant to take place after all eight of the films. But according to director Darren Lynn Bosman, who did numbers two, three, and four, this is the ninth installment of Saw, but it's not Saw 9. What it is, is a fan film by Chris Rock, who stars, produces, ad-libs, and has been a big fanboy of the series, and he wanted to do his own spin on it. He will reference scenes from like Saw 3, and I'm like, wait, what? And he's like, it's the scene in Saw 3 in the second act. And I go back and I'm like, oh shit, he's right. He pretty much met the head of Lionsgate at a wedding and pitched a flip on the franchise referring to his idea as the bloodiest episode of Law and Order. Eddie Murphy and Nick Nolte in 48 hours, but they're, it's a horror movie. But what's crazy is that in his movie Top 5, which was also a Lionsgate movie, he played an actor doing a press run for a film that ends up losing out to a fictional Medea flick called Boo, which Lionsgate would then actually take seriously and adapt not once, but twice. It was a fake movie. Chris called and asked if he could use the character for the movie and boo him a deal Halloween. I'm thinking, okay, great, fine. And when Lionsgate saw it, they said, wait a minute, you got to do that movie. I'm like, are you serious? You want me to do a movie called Boo a Medea Halloween? So I guess uh, they old rock one and gave him the Halloween spot. Now, in my opinion, the traps are always best to experience with a group and I think still deliver here, but it, it, the story does end up being more of a discount rent to, with, with a bunch of stuff that we've already seen in previous Saw movies. Let me explain. Now, the last we saw the series, Kramer, the mastermind behind it all, had died, but left behind a cult that was ready to spread his puzzles for a new generation that needed to learn its lessons. And the writers were even actually in the middle of writing a prequel for Kramer when... All of a sudden, Pete and I are walking down the street and we get a phone call and they said, put down everything you're doing, Chris Rock, wants to do a Saw film, come up with something. And it really is a Chris Rock train. Dude was coming up with stuff on the spot. It's the first Saw movie that was shot mostly in the day to fit his schedule. And he made sure that they didn't write half the script since he was gonna be coming up with all the comedy while they handled all of the traps. But I made sure I had nothing to do with the traps. You know, I had like literally, I was like, no, 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 don't even show it to me. I don't even wanna know what it is. In the intro, it's clear Chris Rock took heavy inspiration from Tarantino's Reservoir Dogs by having a similar opening banter like they did, except his is about Forrest. I ain't seen no sequel. Where's Gump 2? There's even a Vincent and Jules Easter egg from Pulp Fiction that you see right here. The fact that his character is named Ezekiel. And not to mention, Sam Jackson himself appears. People always go, how'd you get Sam? He did you a favor. No, we got Sam a check. You wanna play games, motherfucker? He played my dad, and it was great. He's kind of method, so he insisted on sleeping with my mother. In the movie, Zeke's father was the previous chief, who, for whatever reason, had a portrait of a tricycle in his room, just like this cop has a mug saying pig out. But Zeke is living in the shadow and is forced to get a rookie partner since no one in the department likes him, mainly because he turned in his previous corrupt partner about a decade ago, causing the entire department to turn their backs on him, leaving rat traps all over his desk, and leading to him getting shot for not following their code. I am a member of a gang. Only we have badges. One of the clear influences was Seven, with the cast even prepping by watching it before filming this one. And while I think that they overdo it on the homages, it has always been a part of their series roots. So we thought we were making Seven. We didn't really realize we were making a horror film, but when we did a deal with Lionsgate to distribute it, Tim Palin, who is the head of everything creative there, said, this is a horror film. That said, they relied on seven times the exposition. Like in the first precinct scene, between two people who already know each other, they inform us on both of their backgrounds. 12 years ago, I turn in a dirty cop, I get a medal for it, and I got to look over my back for the rest of my career. Their parents? Just because your dad was chief fucking Marcus Banks. Stop making this about my father, okay? Hell the weather? Shut up! I got a heat wave going on. We got rolling blackouts. The city is nuts. This one also has the cinematographer who did God's Plan and a couple of other Drake videos. So they were definitely going for a different aesthetic. They they wanted to film it in a different format. It really. I didn't love the way Jigsaw looked. It was so polished and pretty and it, it looked like almost like a CW version of Saw. And that goes for the music as well. See, one of the producer's son actually listens to 21 Savage and knew that 21 was a fan of the movies and literally convinced his dad to get him involved. My favorite track from the movie will probably be my track, which is Spiral and obviously because I made it. So legit, Sir Savage has an official Saw original motion picture soundtrack. Saw more like a thriller than like scary. Like, I don't like 
like where the ghosts come out the toilet and all that. I don't like them type movies. Guess they really went in on the idea of trap music. Now, like the previous installments, the perpetrator setting up the traps usually has a motive or is trying to call something out. You know, we've seen the series get into gentrification. They went in heavy on the health insurance. And here, the main people getting trapped are the cops. So while I know it's been something that we've seen before in the series, Spyro using a pig head is, it's very honest now. He's out there trying to reform the police who've abused their power. And if they don't, then he abolishes them. <laughs> The first guy's trap involves him getting his tongue cut out since he's continuously lied under oath. And it's crazy to think that they built this entire train set from scratch and it literally cost half the budget of what the first saw was. This character also had a longer side story. Nothing out of the ordinary. No. There was one thing that was a black SUV parked outside one night last week. Originally, this was supposed to be a red herring that had them on the hunt only to realize that the dude was cheating on his wife with another man, but at the end they ended up cutting it out, so all we see is the man getting railed. The second, Detective Fitch, was a trigger-happy cop who gets put into the worst finger trap that you can imagine. I personally thought this was the most gruesome one, and I guess the MPAA agreed because they ended up cutting out 75% of this trap, with the original scene going through every single little piggy getting yanked out of his hand. Sound plays such an important role in the MPAA, and so when you take all the sound out, they're like, fine, that's an R. The third ends up being Zeke's new partner, Will, who gets completely skinned, which to me made no sense, especially with the pattern that they were going in the movie of telling you what they did wrong in the department, but here, there wasn't really anything. Like, they just set up a body at a meat shop that was completely butchered to dupe you with a tape that fades in the background, so you can't really hear what they were saying. The fourth ends up being Captain Garza, who gets a text from the chief, even though, you know, they, they would definitely have had longer texts. Her deadly sin is that she's always covered up for the department, and originally her torture was going to be a marathon of Riverdale, but they decided that this wax trap was much faster and less painful. During the case, they end up hitting Chris with rocks, papers, and glass, when the fifth victim ends up being his previous partner, they've got this dude strapped up on a harness, cutting up his back worse than Jim Caviezel's. And even though this was the dude that Zeke turned in, he's not trying to take him out, which at a certain point ended up actually piercing Chris's back while they were filming because this is a series that's always boasting practical effects, minimal to no CG. And again, Chris didn't want to know anything. We actually hung the actor. Without going too much detail, he had to kick the ladder away and then he was suspended in midair before something happened to him. Everyone knows that the traps are always gonna be the stars of these movies. Like the crew themselves even refer to these shoots as set apart trap days. So without a doubt, I hope that we do get that full unrated director's cut that's meant to be over two hours long. The final person to get duped by Pighead is Chris's father, who's played by the one and only Sam Jackson. And I love Sam because he he just adds a levity to it. Like this dude has played every character who, who's been in the forest like so many times before. And he brings in even a little bit of what he did in that Shaft reboot. We haven't had a meal together in over a year. You want to go get a fucking slice? Now, I'm not taking away from Chris. I think the man is a legend. Dude is an icon. But homie kept putting on this face when he tried to act serious. Like, you can just tell there was a punchline ready to come out. And especially when you have these shaky shots that I know were visual homages to the previous installments. It just, it looked like my dude needed Pepto for his diarrhea. Now, as far as the killer goes, which is the big spoiler right here, I, I thought it was pretty obvious that it was going to be the partner. All throughout his training day, he was dropping clues. Your dad's the reason for all of this. He's why I want to do this in the first place. Like Chris was smart enough to not plug in the drive to his computer, but he just gave this dude his cell phone? Nah. Turns out that his father was shot by Zeke's old partner because he knew too much. And so this dude made it his life goal to somehow join the department, scope out all of their social networks, and magically become Zeke's partner as he handmade all these traps to get back at the department that killed his dad, which is ironic considering he did the same to these kids who he's playing with after murdering their pops. But that's not even meant to be the big twist of the movie, but rather the decision that Zeke has to make as he's playing into his game. And that's where the main theme of the series starts to play, which interestingly enough is called Zep 9, contrary to what Darren said, but it's here where Zeke realizes that his dad is just as corrupt as the rest of them and has to decide whether he's going to set his dad free or get the killer with the final bullet that he has. Sadly, while Sam Jackson was able to make it out of Winter Soldier by sawing through literal cement, here he's hanging on by a thread bleeding out. Personally, if I'm a detective who's well versed on the Jigsaw Killer, I'm not wasting my one bullet on anything other than the perp, but instead he lets him get away. So for a movie that cut out all of the classic salt transitions that they actually did film, got rid of all of the memorable marketing because they wanted to set up a new vibe. For a movie that supposedly really wanted to go completely different, we wanted it to feel completely different. They just end up ending it the same way that they've done before. And 
that's it. So uh, thank you all for watching. Clearly, things spiraled quickly at the end, and it seems like they are going to do a separate trilogy. It sounds like they're going to be having the Jigsaw line still going. They reportedly have a TV series coming up, and eventually they'll actually continue the Legacy series and probably do a proper Saw follow-up, if not that Kramer prequel that they were talking about. But either way, there's no doubt that they're rushing whatever the next script is already. For seven years, they made movies every single year, which means you wrap a film, and while they're editing the film, you're already writing the next one in order to be ready to start production to do another film. Personally, I don't think that anything's going to pass the first two in my opinion, but I'm curious to see where they take it. I'm sure that they're eventually going to combine everything, and I think that with a series, they may be able to flesh out uh, more of the cult of Kramer to a degree. Uh, but for this one, uh, again, I, I just hope that when it comes to these big franchises, I love Chris Rock. I, I didn't mind the movie as much, um, but yeah, it does come off a lot as a fan film. Uh, there's also a lot of like interesting cameos in there, like Wayne Gretzky's son is in this, which was interesting to see. Uh, even the, I, I found out that in the commentary track that the, the pizza place is owned by one of the producers, so... You wanna go get a fucking slice? But they're definitely expanding it to be something different than what a lot of us grew up with, and we'll, we'll, we'll see where they take it from here. I'm curious to see what your thoughts on this movie are, on the series, how, how you would rank them in what order, and what you wanna see next. But until next time, don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe, unless you... <laughs>